Okay, we're back. Um, I'm hoping that you guys were able to uh, uh, reconnect with me. We've had some uh, uh, internet connection issues. I believe I was talking about uh, the uh, coming from verses 11 uh, through 15, uh, how uh, leaders, bad leaders, unfortunately, through the permissive will of God, can be allowed uh, to lead the countries because of their disobedience. And we talked about what's going to happen uh, to the nation of Egypt as it relates to what Isaiah prophesies uh, in this particular passage of scripture. And just before we got cut off, I was talking about we have to really consider some of the situations and circumstances that we have experienced even in our country uh, with leaders. And we wonder how did these leaders get into the positions that they're in? Uh, not that God put them there, but that the uh, permissive will of God allowed them to be there to cause us to really think about uh, uh, him and where we are in our position. And I'm here to tell you we have had some leaders uh, in our recent history uh, that have caused us to really take a look at uh, closer at our relationship with God. So now moving on, let's take a look at uh, Isaiah chapter 19 verses 16 through 17. Uh, in that day the Egyptians will become like women they will resemble, they will tremble and be in dread because of the wavering hand of the Lord of hosts, which he is going to wave over them. The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which he is purposing against them. Now, here comes a very interesting prophecy as it relates to Egypt, as it relates to his relationship with Judah. That, that is very uh, noteworthy at this particular point in time. So now, because of the waving of the hand of the Lord of hosts, all the Lord needs to do is wave his hand. The people of Egypt will respond in terror. Uh, they will be afraid and they will be in fear. It goes on to say that the land of Judah will be a terror in Egypt, or a terror to Egypt. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a dramatic change. For listen, for thousands of years, the land of Judah lay submissively in the shadow of the great Egyptian empire. But now what we see that the, that the Lord has Isaiah prophesies a day when Judah will be mightier than Egypt and the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Now, many believe that this passage in uh, Isaiah chapter 19 verses 16 through 17 had its beginnings uh, of its fulfillment with the uh, Israeli victory and land acquisition after the Six Day War. Uh, the Six Day War, which was in June, from June 5th to June 10th of 1967. The Six Day War of 1967, many people will say that this was the beginning of uh, Egypt beginning to fear Judah. This was the beginning of Judah becoming or Israel becoming uh, dominant over their enemies. Now, but however, after many other military engagements after that, many deaths and alliances that were not necessarily sanctioned by God, many believe that this prophecy has not yet occurred. Because for those of us who may know a little history, uh, uh, that whole situation lasted for a while, but then a number of other issues began to happen, another of Another groups of alliances that were not sanctioned by God begin to happen. People begin to do things and use things instead of trusting God. Remember now, at the end of the day, God said simply, trust me. He said, I didn't tell you to make alliances with other countries. Trust me. I didn't say in the 21st century, the 20th century for that matter, get you some nuclear weapons. He said, trust me. And so it becomes important for us to understand because he has said, Isaiah has already prophesied a time when the enemies of God are going to be submissive to God. And sometimes we mess up by trying to rush the timeline. Now, Isaiah foretells, F-O-R-E, tells in verses 18 through 22 that Egypt and Assyria will come to worship God with Judah. Now, that's going to be interesting, okay? Look at verses 18 through 22 of Isaiah chapter 19. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. 
but they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors. And he will send them a savior and a companion, a champion, and he will deliver them. The Lord will make herself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offering, and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing. So they will return to the Lord, and he will respond to them, and he will heal them. Now listen, Isaiah here is showing the people of the northern kingdom of Israel as well as the southern kingdom of Judah in these passages, in this prophecy, that God is as much a God of grace and restoration as he is a God of justice. And so, of course, Isaiah then begins to close this 19th chapter with the words of an amazing grace or amazing peace between three currently hostile enemies. There's three currently hostile enemies uh, that are in this passage of scripture that takes us out to the end of this chapter today. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 19, verses 23 through 25. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into, the, into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Wow. Okay. Now you're talking about an F-O-R-E telling. You're talking about a foretelling prophecy. Here it is, God promises. He gives Isaiah this word, this prophecy. God promises that the day will come when there will be peace between Israel, Egypt, and Assyria. I mean, that's pretty fantastic, okay? It says now, the passage is saying that there will be trade and travel between the three nations. When it talks about a highway from Egypt to Assyria, in that day, the Lord will bless all three nations. What a prophecy. What an amazing work of redemption and restoration. And it only shows us, brothers and sisters, that, that God, when his will is enacted, he can restore those things that seem impossible to us, that seem unlikely to us. But it's important for us to make absolutely sure that we trust him as it relates to that. And as the title of today's uh, set, uh, says a change is coming a change is coming now this prophecy shows the people of the time as well as the people of the text that God's salvation will extend to all nations and he will call forth his own from Egypt Assyria and not only Israel okay now it was powerful to say this of Egypt uh, it is almost unbelievable to say it about Assyria. You know, the nation that Jonah hated so much. You know, Nineveh and Assyria is the same country, okay, just known by different names at the time. It becomes important for us to understand that uh, it becomes very, very powerful for God to give a prophecy to one of his prophets to say that uh, Egypt is going to know the Lord, that Assyria is going to know the Lord and that Egypt, Assyria, and all of Israel are going to be on one accord worshiping and knowing God. Now, it's important for us to understand now, in Isaiah's day, Assyria was the one power feared by every little nation in the land. That land also called the Fertile Crescent. Now, Assyria wasn't big enough to take on uh, big boys like Egypt or big boys like Babylon. Okay, but it became important for them that Syria as a country would take on because they were powerful. They would take on the smaller nations and they would, they would decimate them. They would annihilate them. It was horrible the things that they would do. Uh, the calculated brutality of the Assyrians, Assyrians rather, probably made them more of an object of general hatred than of any nation at that time. But yet and still, it's important for us to understand that God says they're going to come to him. Listen, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Persians were all capable of inhumane acts. 
but the Assyrian record for callous cruelty is difficult to compare. Now that's pretty hard, that's pretty tough. But yet and still, God says that they're gonna come in, they're gonna come to him. It becomes important for us to understand that. Imagine standing amid the terrors of the plagues. Who could ever have supposed that Egypt would be addressed as my people by God? You think of how, and you know, we're, we're familiar with Moses, we're familiar with the children of Israel being in captivity of Egypt land, and we know how God dealt with every one of their idol gods by providing a plague that showed that God was in control of every god that they considered themselves worshiping, whether it was frogs, whether it was lice, whether it was cattle, whatever it may have been, uh, God, God showed that he was in control of those things and, and, and literally decimated them and, and made Pharaoh come to the point, and even life itself, with the firstborns that were taken. Uh, well, Pharaoh himself was, would let the people go. And yet and still, even with that, they tried to come back and take them back, lost many lives in the, in the Red Sea. And, so, and then even with that, as time would pass, they still would become a power uh, not as powerful as they were at that particular time, but a power that would still bring difficulty to uh, the children of Israel, the children of God. But yet and still, with all of that, and with all of the things that God has done to them, and with all the things they have not done for God or with God, there's going to come a time when God says, they're going to be my people. Man, that's really heavy. Okay? But then, if you like that, try this on for size. Who could have thought that Assyria the tyrant persecutor would ever be called the work of my hands. Okay, yes, these people, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, and even the Jews, the Northern Kingdom of Israel as well as the Southern Kingdom of Judah, all of them would ultimately become benefactors of God's grace. What is grace? Undeserved love, unmerited favor. You know, a uh, Baptist preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon he penned these words regarding the grace of God, and I think they fit today's lesson. God's grace often comes to the very worst of men. God's grace sends a savior. Grace changes men's language. Grace, God's grace sets men on holy service. God's grace teaches men to pray. God's grace instructs men. Grace makes even trouble a blessing to a man. God's grace changes the relations of men to each other. And God's grace makes men to be blessed and to be a blessing to others. And of course, sisters, you know that means ladies too. It becomes important for us to understand that. It is important, brothers and sisters, to remember that many of Isaiah's prophecies, his prophetic proclamations, if you will, have yet to be fulfilled, which makes this such an intriguing book to read and study. That's why folk like studying the book of Isaiah. You know, it, at face value, it makes you sound like you're really into learning about how God works uh, in this world in which we live today and how he has worked in the world that is uh, in our past, biblically speaking. But it becomes important that as we get caught up in the uh, the, the novelty of studying this book of Isaiah that we carefully watch the prophecy that God is giving and continues to give yet a lot in these studies of Isaiah. You know, we see uh, one such example uh, in Isaiah chapter 19, the one we're studying today, where the prophet writes, In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord and its border." And it will be a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a mighty one, and he will deliver them. That's in verses 19 and 20. This, this passage from Isaiah describes a future moment in time when large portions of Egypt will actually align with Judah in worshiping the one true God. Now, we know that today that hasn't happened yet. But God's word is inerrant. God's word is true. God's word will come to pass. It becomes important for us to understand that this is an important foretelling, F-O-R-E-telling prophecy that Isaiah gives as relates to this. 
Now, in Isaiah's day, such a dramatic turn in Egypt's religious position would have been unthinkable. So, and even today, with the political realities of our world, such spiritual unity seems unlikely. However, what does Isaiah do? Isaiah tells us that Egyptian citizens will one day speak the language of Canaan. That's in verse 8, okay, as they worship the Lord. And brothers and sisters, it becomes important for us to understand that we can look forward in faith to the future and to the further affirmation of the inerrancy and the authority of God's word. Or in other words, God's word will accomplish that that it has been sent to accomplish. Amen. Change is coming. We hope you've been blessed and helped by our study on today. Uh, we do uh, say that it was an unfortunate reality of that that has happened with us technically on today. Uh, we hope and pray that you were able to navigate through that and catch uh, both sides of this lesson that we attempted to bring to you today. So until uh, we have an opportunity to come back again, we want you to take care and God bless. I want to thank uh, Sister Jones, our camera person, who's really been working today uh, to make this possible. Say hello, Sister Jones. Good morning. And so until next time, take care and God bless.